this program and uh, UFOs, and that the kind of manipulation that we're seeing uh, around them is that basically it's being engineered from two different sides of the spectrum, the intelligence side and the marketing side, because on the marketing side, they can squeeze the dollars out of it. And on the intelligence side, they can keep their secrets, which is really their goal, let's face it. Mm. Um, so this is about where we find ourselves. And it's not a very good position to be in. We're really squeezed in the middle. Yeah. you know. And uh, I find that it's a very good place for disinformation to thrive. We're seeing this cult activity being pushed in kind of the new age side of it, which is why we call it the series New Age Deep State. Yeah. It's when you get into UFOs and when you get into secret space program, you know, for me, when I look at the research around secret space program, I can't imagine for a moment that it's religious in any way, shape or form. It's just information about a program that we've put together out there. So the fact that these forces with shows like Cosmic Disclosure and with characters like Car uh, Corey Good, they're making Blue Avians and uh, the centerpiece of the secret space program, which is a religious idea. And they have all this religious iconography, the Blue Avians holding up their hand. And we've, we've had a lot of people actually point out that it's very Luciferian imagery. Yeah. Um, and so we're definitely seeing religious aspects creep in here. And they're trying to make the whole thing into some kind of spiritualist revival, which is very odd uh, to do around UFOs and the secret space program. Well, I, I think um, they're onto something there. Already back in the day, Dr. Oh, the French guy, ufologist, uh, Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée, yeah. Yeah, he was onto the cultish aspects of it. And if you do want to revive, if you want to make a cult for, I don't know, power, money, just mm -hmm. disinformation, uh, it's smart to, you know, put one foot into that spiritual area. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's clever and clever and dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous to us, clever for them. Yeah, uh, exactly. But if you get you get people wrapped up in a fake religion, I mean, we we've seen a lot of that. Yep, like most religions. <laughs> yeah, like most religions. <laughs> I mean, we've we've already seen a lot of fallout with Scientology and what happens when you try to integrate these things and just kind of cook up your own religion out of the blue. Yeah, and not so out of the blue either, because there are some intelligence connections to the origins of. Yes. Uh, Scientology. But. With Hubbard and yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's also Crowley hanging out there. And uh, on space program. Yes. Um, what's it called? Jack uh, Parsons? Jack Parsons, yes. Yeah, yeah. And Parsons was a representative of Crowley's OTO there in Los Angeles and was really, we could, that would make a whole show in itself. So yeah. the new age deep state aspect they they did get manipulated if you go through the periods you were talking about, like the 60s and with the hippies and all the rest of it. Uh, these spiritual ideas moved in the 60s. They moved into higher consciousness. They moved into yoga. They moved into chakras. They moved into life after death. They moved into psychic experience. And those things are dangerous, I think, for controllers of society. They need to get a handle on them mm. because I do think that they tend to lose control when people start taking possession of their own consciousness. They can't have that... You know what? That's exactly what I discussed in my recent program with uh -huh. Alex Sakiris of the Skeptical Podcast. Yeah, it sounds great. I I definitely will familiarize myself with him more now that it's Skeptico. I figured out. Yeah, I have run across that before. I haven't really checked it out. If you find a time, check it out. It's called Why. Yeah, I will. Why scientism is wrong about everything. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, great title, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That was my point. You're making it. <laughs> Continue. This is music in my ears. I would definitely say that you can see that when you look at things like the peace movement, for example, that they were manipulated, like you were saying, with intense drugs with characters fanatics and all the rest of it to make the rest of the movement look bad and mm. uh this is what we've seen with the new age and with the ufo communities the ufo communities were and these are communities more of research you know when i say ufo community it's it's yeah. their community of researchers people are interested in the topic hang on don't we see this about everything you could say greenpeace you could say masons like we talked about don't they want to taint and control or ridicule Everything that can somehow be a threat to their power monopoly. I think it has to be an across-the-board pattern. Mm. 
There's no doubt about it. It's that thing that Fitz says, if there's one county that gets out of drug running, like, for example, there's a big movement in one of these counties to get rid of the drug running that was going on. And out of the blue, there were black helicopters were showing up and it was real and people were being harassed. And it was like, what's going on here? It's because these counties, the drug money is so important on the black budget side that if one county gets out, Right. They become the model for other counties to become liberated. So they have to be smacked down. And the same would be true in these different areas. But certainly I would I would think that, you know, ordinarily when you look at things like the New Age or you look at things like UFO research, your first thought wouldn't be, oh, it's controlled by the government. No. Because it seems like it's some independent thing that you'll pick up and do on your own. But I think there came a point... And, and who's the government? I mean, I think these forces also control government. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. The government doesn't have that much control. <laughs> I, I think the government is the first thing they're taking over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we have so many names now. We have the deep state, the breakaway civilization yep. well one of the we know one of the worst names for anything is the illuminati yeah. it's it's one of the worst names. let's just trash that here on the show yeah um we discussed this the last time actually what to call these structures yes. remember yes absolutely. And I, I don't but know I do if think we concluded anything but we had many good candidates there are good there are good candidates and you said secret government was one of yours i remember that yeah, I, no, not secret government. I think it was, um, or could it be in the cabal maybe? But you, you, you stuck with Mr. Global because that's a contemporary, very valid expression. Mr. Global is something that came out of Fitz uh, and her work. And basically yeah. it, it does add up because it's this kind of phantom force. You can't get your hands on it, but you can see the work that they do. I think, I think yeah. the on the level term is the deep state. Yeah. And because that comes from the sound research of Professor Scott. And really what he did is he said, oh, there's two different things going on here. And I think that the recent wave of the media taking his term, the deep state, and applying it to everything and saying, well, there is no American deep state. Don't worry about it is fascinating. Yeah, but look, everybody sees through this. Yes. It's an obvious intelligence uh, distraction narrative when people can see clearly now what's going on. Uh, that they're losing control. Because uh, not very long ago, the curve of the declining line of mainstream media uh, viewers or listeners or readers yes. has crossed for the first time the independent media. Yep. But, uh, you know, they're under pressure, Google and YouTube. So we'll see. <laughs> There's no question about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I think the timing is good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But for many reasons. Somehow the timing is rather perfect. <laughs> yeah. They had an organized attempt to take over YouTube and Google, as you probably know. Mm -hmm. Many people have emigrated from YouTube because of that. Mm -hmm. All these companies, <laughs> even uh, I think BBC was one of them. So <laughs> it's obvious who's in cahoots here. Disney. <laughs> Everybody tried to force Google and YouTube and, and Google and YouTube have now implemented censorship yes. uh, for independent. And, and I see that because I often, we like in our channel certain videos mm -hmm. because then they come in the front. Some keywords, if it has like Syria in it or yep. some, something, it won't even show at the front page of our channel or anything like that. So it's a lot of things they've implemented. This is just an example. And for YouTube and Google, the end game is that mm -hmm. this is my conspiracy hypothesis, but it's very realistic if you if you look into it. They've realized that TV is and, and of course newspapers is already a dead medium. Yeah. So they're thinking, okay, we need to be present online. Mm -hmm. Now their problem is that the independent media is, is ruling online, right? We've been here for 10, 20, 15 yes, years, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they don't want to play fair. So what do they do? Well, okay. Let's squeeze out the system critical voices from let's let's choose YouTube because that's the biggest platform right now for these things. Mm -hmm. Let's take over YouTube and let's transform it into a platform for all mainstream media, meaning, all right. yes, uh, not just Fox and CNN, but also MSNBC, uh, CBS, everybody are welcome here. All the competitors, because they're really on the same side at the end of the day, right? Oh, yeah. The, yeah. So this will be our playpen. And let's get rid of all the others. That's their end of the game. And I think it's doomed to fail, if you ask me. Absolutely. Because even if they did manage to have a monopoly or more or less dominate YouTube, people would leave it because the problem isn't the platform, it's the contents. 
<laughs> well, they yeah, I absolutely agree. They they already slashed um, so much of what the independent media was using in order to monetize their channels and their websites and blogs and all the rest of it. And uh, by saying, well, your content's not accepted, your video's not accepted for monetization, there was this huge model where all those alternative sites depended on Google. Now, I never went into that, so I was happy. And we discussed that last time, and that's <laughs> we, clever of you. We did. Well, we were lucky because there were a lot of them who depended on it and actually were making good money doing it, and then they fell on their face. Yeah. And a lot of them got out. Who yep. just you know they either got out or they're facing a much smaller bottom line in terms of doing their work. Um, so that part worked. They collapsed a lot of channels that talked about war, for example. Uh, they they certainly got after these channels at the right and at the left. Yes, absolutely. But it is interesting because now on Twitter, I find out from a lot of viewers that my content is listed as sensitive material. Yep. Some of your videos wouldn't show yes. at our front Un page when we liked it. Some would, others wouldn't. Wow. So you were struck, of course, by the censor. Uh, but there is there is that. Uh, the weirdest stuff is from this uh, Corey Good cult because they almost daily, they've kind of stopped in the last few days, but almost daily they were issuing privacy complaints, copyright complaints, wow. anything that they could. And uh, YouTube kicked their ass. They didn't get anything. No. Um, so, and the way I look at it is really you want to be able to uh, deliver your work in a variety of mediums because you never know. For example, when I was doing the New Age Deep State thing, there were so many complaints from the company, the three-year disclosure marketing company against my videos that they were trying to wow. threaten the channel to, to pull down the channel because, of course, mm -hmm. their their legal threats were all kind of like bellicose. And, but this is the kind of sensitivity which, you know, I know YouTube pretty well and so I know how to get around frivolous complaints. But the thing is, you do have to do that and I think it's getting to this point where – it's fascinating because on one end of the spectrum, as an independent media outfit, you'll have the pressure of the mainstream media trying to get rid of you. And on the other end of the spectrum, you'll have those forces that are coming in to do marketing into the independent media space. Yeah, third forces. Third forces. And so it's you're getting caught in the middle. Yeah, I was just thinking that because when you put a critical light on them, you would expect some backlash from Absolutely. from their people. Absolutely. There's no question about it. It is. So you notice it already. Yeah. But I would say this, that what happens, though, whenever you open up the conversation, it's a wild card. <laughs> so in a way, opening up the conversation against the mainstream media, opening up the conversation against those third force aspects and in independent media open, mm. you know, opens the door to a wild card and you, you might just find this pathway between the two. And that's what we've been doing. But certainly the important thing from my point of view is to bring forward the ideas unfiltered without the junk conspiracy on top of yeah, and without the pressure from the mainstream media official story. Yeah, we discussed this the last time and uh, a problem I consider then that I think is still haunting us is that how are we, you know, supposed to win this battle? Because like I was uh, insinuating earlier in this discussion is that we have a, mm -hmm. uh, we are not following into this uh, false dichotomy, the black white thing. We are trying to get to truth, which is more synthetic and you have to have several thoughts yeah, at the same time. I say we, I mean, not just you and me, but many good outlets out there are like that. I'd, I'd say throw in skeptic or two since i already mentioned yes that. but the problem is like you say we fall between two chairs uh, and uh, we can come in the scissor and also it's harder to reach a bigger audience because unfortunately the more you dumb down the bigger impact you'll have right that's why Corey Good and those people and or Gaia <laughs> TV can run with what they've got. Yeah. So, but uh, this is the reason I also invited you now is to help you get some focus on this breaking story of yours. Yes. Because uh, if enough people, um, subversive people, anti-authoritarian, alternative, conspiracy, what you want to call it, gets it, 
then truth can come out on the good side of this and um, people like you who's been working so hard for that can can actually earn from it rather than suffer oh well yeah i really appreciate that what what i see about all this is that with a real quality outlet of information like what you guys do in the grand scheme of things things like the three-year disclosure marketing plan and Corey Good and David Wilcock, they they will burn out because yeah, they're true. they're but the very nature of their thing is to borrow content, and borrow is a very kind word in this case. Yeah. Uh, but they're going to repurpose content from other users, and it's like a fashion thing. It is it has to run out. Yes. Uh, so I will say that people will come to know quality that's consistent, and in like the shows mm. that you do and the guests that you bring forward. So this is very important, and. From my perspective, what I've learned from dealing with this whole thing around the New Age Deep State, on one hand, I've given myself a window by researching their activities on that end of the independent spectrum, Uh, you know, this third force coming in. But I've always seen it, so I've been aware of it anyway. But the education that I've got is this, which is the real outfits, and I consider like ForbiddenKnowledgeTV.net, for example, Solari.com. Giza Death Star. These are important sites that have important yeah. information, the work that you guys are doing, what we do at Dark Journalist. This is a core of information that works as a bulwark against the rise of that kind of third force. junk conspiracy, yeah. third force. Yeah. And and it also stands very strongly against the mainstream media pressure to eliminate the independent alternative voices. So in a way, this is a real strong core. And, uh, you know, I, I only see that this core is going to grow because I think that the content is exciting. The information is useful yeah. and uh, the th- it's thought provoking stuff. So for people who are coming in for that, they're going to get what they came in for. I agree. But I think uh, a requisite for succeeding is the two things. One, we have to embrace diversity. Mm-hmm. We have to accept that everybody isn't agreeing about everything. Yes. Uh, because it's a, it's an advantage that you will have different sub, uh, versions. It's not just about opinions or what you identify with or what ideas you subscribe to, but also what approaches you take. Some will be more concerned about, let's say, spacecrafts and technology and stuff like that. Some more, maybe more spirituality. So maybe more science and, and so, so that's one thing, diversity. We have to accept it. And the other thing is not to fall into the false dichotomy because in addition to the mainstream pressure and the bullshit pressure, right, right, they can right. also have the false dichotomy pressure. Like you saw in the extremely polarizing times around the election. Oh yeah. Where, where you can lose perspective and suddenly potential Uh, allies becomes quote unquote enemy because you chosen the wrong label, the wrong color. Yes. Wrong symbol to identify with. And that's very dangerous because that is the game they've been playing. Well, the whole Cold War was about that, Mm goddammit. Yeah, right, right. They're experts (laughs) at it. They've been at it for a long time. Yeah. And I think a part of the grown up movement is to be able to tolerate that not everybody agrees about everything and also not lose ourselves in any temporary wave of symbol. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you can look at this in all these different communities that we've talked about, uh, whether it's around the political deep state work. There are people who – it's fascinating – Professor Scott was <laughs> he's he has some great stories along this line, but one of the great stories that he has is that there's this writer who absolutely reruns uh, his stories uh, at global research and all the rest of it. And you know, he absolutely gets this spot on and that spot on. But whenever uh, Scott mentions nine eleven, Forget it. He's listening as a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. His stuff goes in the shoot. You know, it's it's all mm. over. And this is the nature of the thing, right? You have these people who they have their pet issues, and if they, if you don't agree with them on one particular thing, then you're out, just completely. Yeah. Or you're you're a part of the plotters. Yes, right. Like you, you're an Illuminati agent to the <laughs> sincere followers of uh, Corey. Corey, Good. good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the easy answer. And the funny thing is, oh, yeah. we saw it in the 9-11. Bill and the Witch. 
<laughs> exactly. We saw it in the 9-11 movement when Judy Wood came forward with her theories. Yeah, poor woman. And it was, this was fascinating because she had a great body of work. Mm. And it was a really interesting angle, but because people were so married to these different narratives around thermite or whatever it happened to be, uh, she became persona non grata. Oh, yeah. She was shut down. For those groups. And, you know, this is ridiculous because they all believe that something happened around 9-11 that was instigated as a deep event by covert forces. But nonetheless, because she had a different theory than where they were coming from, she became a disinformation agent, you know, poop. Yeah. So this is the kind of thing, and this is the problem, I think, when we get into the independent side, which is there's a lot of pushing a, a particular narrative. We, which goes back to my point that we have to grow up. And a part of that is to accept diversity. Mm -hmm. And also we have to accept that we can live with not having the final answers about everything. <laughs> right, right. So what if we don't know the whole and entire truth? People need to train to be open and critical. So, okay, I accept that this isn't true, but it doesn't mean that I have to run to whatever polarity that has. Uh, yes. For me, it's like, okay, I accept that per now, this I don't understand entirely, uh, but I'm open to learning more. And uh, I'm also open to revising if the evidence points out. And I, I think that kind of thinking can be promoted in, in more general terms within the uh, so-called alternative. And then, yeah, absolutely. Then, it, then they can't use those tricks against us because then you have an alert population. Mm -hmm. Let's say like 9-11, right? You weren't there. You weren't people who actually perpetrated it. So how dare you be emotionally attached to one hypothesis and, mm -hmm. you know, scream over. You're not better than the debunkers when you do that. Yeah. Absolutely. And this goes for anything. Anything we've discussed today that has triggered people, oh, listen to them. Oh, I don't agree. Fine, don't agree. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> because it's easy to know what didn't go down, but it's hard to know exactly what happened. And that's why we have to be open for several possibilities of what has happened, as long as we agree about what didn't happen. You see what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the point is, to kind of to arrive at the truth is not to shut out the facts when it doesn't agree with your perspective at all. This is the, the nature of the thing. So I think we do need a, a better idea of how we think about evidence. And in alternative media, it's, it's on the independent side, really, when you get right down to it, the only things that are going to survive and do well, in my opinion, are outfits that don't have a lot of bias. Because in the grand scheme of things, it gets old. And if you want someone to trust you as a source, then they're going to need to see that you have the wide angle lens. One of the biggest dangers that I see coming into the alternative media and into the space generally around alternative research, independent media is what I call savior programming, you know, and we'll save mm -hmm. that for another show. But this, yeah. this is what we're seeing, which is one thing is a savior, you know, like this guy is a savior, this movement's a savior, this particular point of view is a savior. Even the flat earth thing is kind of savior programming. Yeah. Now that's an also an old card, an old game. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's a dangerous one. And I think at this point, because the internet has grown to such a degree, I think we're seeing heightened levels of marketing and also psyop manipulation of the space you know, on a level that we haven't really seen before. So we've seen it in degrees in mainstream media, but I think it, it's going into a, kind of a heavier phase. And I think the only way to deal with it is to kind of get the paranoia and the superstition out of the independent research and just go for the facts. Yeah. Uh, and that, uh, again, I, I would emphasize the need for diversity. Mm hmm and and your point not falling into particular pet hypothesis and also yes. sincerity i think is a big part of it i think sincerity at the end of the day will come through if you are sincere mm -hmm. sure and, and for me that's an important thing and th and that's something that makes me very critical to what's happening now yeah You're right Corey good and all that stuff oh yeah uh, because it's it's um, um, somehow many people can pick up on on fake eventually i think so i think so you see yeah. just look at politics i think that's the genius of trump that he was 
kind of, like, I call him an honest con man. <laughs> <laughs> People know his shortcomings. Yes. There's nothing they can try to taint him with that will shock us because we know what's true about him. God knows he has a lot of them. <laughs> and then he's like, honest like a child in all that. <laughs> Completely different from Clinton, who is everything is calculated and, <laughs> you know, controlled. Right. So, whereas Ron Paul and Bernie are more straight shooters, they are more like uh, yeah. sincere in another way than, than Trump. But no, diversity is the thing. Like Kennedy said, um, if we cannot now end our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. <laughs> so, so that's what I mean. And uh, diversity in ideas and in quality, but we have to have the common goal of being sincere and also having the right focus, you know, critical against the third force and the first force. I, I definitely agree with that. And I do think everything that helps truth, uh, I see worth also among outlets like uh, Alex Jones. Mm -hmm. And I see at the opposite side, uh, Jimmy Dore, for instance, I like him. So you have many people across the political spectrum that's pulling in the same direction. Uh -huh. If you can kind of not identify with these false dichotomy symbols is my point. You can find uh, those independent media channels that go across the spectrum. And I think that they are there. And although there's a lot of noise and a lot of junk out there uh, in the grand scheme of things, the, uh, the quality exists. I mean, across the board. yeah, we're definitely in a period. It's kind of like there's a pretty good dividing line between quality and stuff that's really falls into a category of just non-listenable. And uh, it is easy to spot, I think. Indeed. Uh, at least if you're used to quality, I think uh, at the end of the day, you'll, you'll um, start seeing through the third force. Absolutely.